budget is late. And it's easy for all of us to get caught up in the theatrics of why the, the budget is late. But the budget is not late because the accountants could not do the math on time. The New York State budget is late because Governor Kathy Hochul is trying to produce a drama, a political drama, that she thinks is going to help her as governor. And we are not here for that. Right now. And after all of this is actually over, actually after the budget is finally passed, media pundits are gonna go on TV, be in the newspapers. They're gonna judge what happened. They're gonna tell us who won this battle. They're gonna tell us who lost this battle. And then they're gonna tell us who's weak and who's, not, and who's powerful and who's going to lead for the next three years. But we are not here for the theater today. Today, we are not here for the politics. Today, we are joined by the ghost of 19 souls who lost their lives on Rikers Island in 2022. And we're also joined by the souls of people who lost their lives in local jails all over the state of New York, from Erie County to Broome County, all the way to Nassau County Jail. We're also here today, we're joined by the tears of the countless women, the countless girls, the countless men and boys, and the countless gender non-conforming people of all ages who've suffered through hell in our jails to maintain their innocence. It was in their names that the state of New York passed landmark laws of bail reform. And it's in their name that we are gonna continue to protect people from jail. Protect people from jail. Kali Browder, say his name. 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 Lali Polanco, say her name. Lali Polanco, say her name. In the coming days, hopefully lawmakers in Albany will actually pass a budget. And that budget is going to give all of us a decision whether or not we're going to be back out here next year and the year after with more names of people who've died in local jails that didn't have to. I'm gonna read a short quote by a great leader that said this in 2001 after they visited Rikers Island. How can this hell on earth exist today? This is about protecting human dignity and this questions who we are as a people when we can allow situations as what we've seen on Rikers exist in a prosperous, mighty city like New York. The fact that this exists is an indictment on everyone and I'm gonna do what I can because no one, no incarcerated person, no corrections officer, no family member who has to visit should witness the reality of Rikers as it exists today. That speaker also compared that visit to Rikers to what they saw happening in Attica 50 years ago. Now, shockingly, that speaker was current governor Kathy Hochul right when she assumed governorship. And surprisingly today, she is making putting people in hell holes like that her number one budget priority, and she's holding the budget up to do this. Amen. I bring this up again. This is her number one budget priority, jailing people. Not safe, decent, affordable housing. Not a quality education for all. Not good jobs. Not an inclusive safety net. Not material support for actual crime victims things that actually improve public safety. She's not focused on any of those things. She's focused on more oppression and less freedom for people who look like me. And this is a failure of leadership and she is on the wrong side of history. That's right. Because cycling people through traumatic jail cells causes them to lose their jobs. 
It causes them to lose apartments and even custody of their children. It forces them to miss routine medical appointments. And at the end of the day, all of those things increase their ability to be rearrested, not decrease. Bail reform has worked. 24,000 New Yorkers were saved from pre-trial trailing while fighting misdemeanor and non-violent felony allegations. They were able to keep their jobs. They were able to keep their housing. They were able to keep their schooling. They were able to keep their families together because family stability is public safety, all right? Every lawmaker in Albany has a decision to make. Are they gonna stand on the side of safety and justice? Or are they gonna stand on the side of more racist failed policies like mass incarceration? I thank all y'all for listening and I'm gonna bring up our first speaker right now. Yeah. Yeah. It's hot, I spoke a lot, we're gonna keep going through this. First up, I have Victor Herrera. He's an advocate and a member from Freedom Agenda. Yeah. And real quick, every speaker when you come up, can you spell your name and say your name for the camera so they know what to say? And Victor. Yes. Okay, behind you. Yes, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Look, you have the mic. What did I use in the mic? Ah, Victor, do you want the megaphone? Nah. Uh, uh, I don't know. You sure? Yeah, Victor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm here for you, bro. I'm here for you. Start uh, my name is Victor Herrera. Spelling my name is B-I-C-T-O-R is the first name. H-E-R-R-E-R-A. -R -R I'm part of Freedom Agenda. CCA and Fair, Fair Chance Housing. All right, uh, I'm here today to speak against the ransom budgets that Governor Ocho is holding towards rolling back the bail, bail reform. Obviously, bail reform was put into place as an equal protection towards the poor minority community. It shouldn't be unfairly rolled back as a result of individuals not being able to afford it. Bill is about equal protection, giving everybody a fair chance, okay, to enjoy the same freedoms that everybody else does, whether you're economically able to or not, okay? I speak against those bail reforms and rollbacks because I am directly impacted. And currently, my brother's incarcerated on, J on Fortune Island, being held against his will, and he cannot defend properly, and he is mentally challenged, and he needs services. Okay, and the only way that these individuals will get those services is not being detained or right, rather being uh, pre-trial supervision under either cases or any other organization that's actually in place to provide those services. I thank you, and again, Freedom Agenda, CCA, and Fair Chance Housing. Thank you. Let me try this out. This is better, y'all like this? Alright, my bad. It's hard. I can't read and hold it, so that's why I did that. Next coming up, it's always good when you have actual champions or when um when you're an advocate. When I'm in Albany, the home base for our bail work is Assembly Member Latrice Walker's office, and it shows you how dedicated she is to this work. And I'm bringing her up right now to speak. Assembly Member from Brooklyn, Latrice Walker. Hi, Latrice Walker. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. I just received a telephone call from my 11-year-old daughter saying to me that she's hungry and she wants something to eat because she just woke up. And I had to say to her, you think you're hungry. <laughs> Your mom has not eaten in five days. And she said, well, mom, that's your choice. <laughs> but have you ever had an opportunity where you looked yourself in the mirror and you said to yourself, if I don't do this, I would never be able to live with myself. That's the feeling that I got when I ran for office to represent the communities of Brownsville, Ocean Hill Brownsville, East New York, Crown Heights, East Flatbush, Cypress Hills, and parts of Bushwick. Because I know that those communities are considered billionaires. 
billion dollar blocks. That's right. Those billion dollar blocks feed a criminal justice system in New York City and New York State as well as our federal government. Without our pressured bodies, the economics of so many communities will suffer. So that's why the number one issue in the state with this budget is jailing our communities. Taking away this opportunity takes away billions of dollars in a criminal injustice system that plagues the bodies, the families, the communities, destabilizes, immoralizes so many individuals to live in inhumane treatment like Rikers Island in the shelter. and people are being denied mental health treatment in the and people are living in cells in one building and their mothers languishing in another building. That's not family. That's not how we keep families together. And in that regard, I say that we will not be able to incarcerate ourselves out of the problem of poverty. We know that the safest communities have the most resources, not the most police officers. And so we are saying, hell no to rollbacks against bail reform. Sexually abused 
by corrections officers. And with this budget, which was due on April 1st, April 13th now, it's really between two camps. The people who want to undo people's civil rights and the people who want to protect them. On one side, you have the New York Post, Republicans, and Governor Kathy Hochul. And on the other side, you have We the People of New York. They want to invest more in prison beds. We want to invest more in mental health beds. They want to hire more corrections officers. We want to hire more teachers. They want to lock more people up. We want to lift more people up. They are counting on you to get tired. They are, get, they are counting on you to give up. They are counting on you to stop fighting. And we cannot do any of those. We have to stay vigilant. It does not matter how long this budget takes. We are standing in solidarity with all the people of New York who deserve their civil rights. Every single one of them. We are standing with our communities and saying, no, you will not take our rights from us. You will not lock us up. You will not undo bail reform. We want to invest in our communities and lift them up. Thank you. Thank you once again, State Senator Jabari Grisport. I'm going to bring up another state senator from Brooklyn and Manhattan and Queens. All right, Tristan Kizak.
don't got much to say, I'm going to bring up our next speaker, an assembly member from Brooklyn, aforementioned comrade Emily Gallagher. Thank you. Yeah. All right, everyone. I am Emily Gallagher. I am the assembly member from Greenpoint in Williamsburg in Brooklyn. And I'm so glad that my senator was bringing up the right side of history. Before I was working in the assembly, I was a public historian. And I know that these revolutions take decades. And we are in the middle of a revolution right now. And it is a revolution that we have tried to do again and again since the Civil War and before the Civil War. And that is to make sure that all of the people in the U.S. are free and, are, and have all of their rights. And right now, that is not the case. That is not the case. Right now, black and brown New Yorkers have fewer rights than others and because we lock up so many of them and because we are taking away so many opportunities in this budget and in the city's budget for education, for uh, employment, for so many of these issues. And it is going to take a long time. Bail reform was historic. It was absolutely historic and you all won that. And a big part of winning is not giving up what you want, not ceding that ground. And the minute we give up on bail reform, we are giving up on human rights. That's a fact. And I am here to say that I am standing with you now and forever for bail reform and for the end of mass incarceration. This has been a, a tool since we we got rid of slavery, in quotes, to continue slavery, to con in continue not paying people for work, to continue controlling people's bodies, to continue controlling where people can and can't live. This is all part of that legacy. We tried and we try and we continue to try and we will fight until we win, whether that is right now or for or far in the future, but I will not give up. And we are going to do it right now because look at all of us who are just a small faction of who is fighting for this. So I stand here as part of history. I stand here knowing history. We have to keep this movement going. We are fighting for our lives. And I am so grateful to all of you. And I'm grateful to the leadership of my colleague, Latrice Walker. Thank you. As incarceration is the new Jim Crow, Emily Gallagher is 100% correct. I'm going to keep this moving on and bring out another assembly member from Brooklyn, Monique Chanor. I just want to start off by saying thank you, thank you, thank you. I stand here and solidarity with all of you, the advocates, my, which is my brothers, my sisters, our family, my colleagues, especially my sister, Assemblywoman Latrice Walker, as we go to this fight. That's right. Yeah. So my name is Monique Chandler-Waterman, a newly elected New York State Assemblywoman in Brooklyn.
What's my colleague here, right here? It's going to be colleague, right here. <laughs> Talk about who's accused of setting up bad packs. And we're, and we're suffering solitary confinement. And Rikers was driving 100 days without a child before taking his life. And we must say his name, Khalif Browder. Khalif Assemblymember Walker and Assemblymember Simon, 2019 for bail reform. We were there when we voted against the real rollbacks in 20 and 21, 22. 
but we are standing strong this year to say, let facts decide. This isn't about election. This is not right. about politics. This is about people. This is about people like Marvin, who were locked out of a Rikers for 11 months because he had no power to negotiate. We don't want the next Marvin Mayfield to be locked in Rikers for 11 months. We want to fight for what we believe in and fight for justice and equity. And be clear, this is an economic and racial justice issue. This is about locking up black and brown people. This is about locking up poor people. So that's all we're talking about today. So we're fighting strong to ensure we don't have those rollbacks. Thank you for fighting all you do. Say his name. Marvin Mayfield. Say his name. Marvin For those of y'all who don't know, Marvin Mayfield was a champion. He was somebody that meant a lot to us. All of us. He, his passing has put a battery in the back of so many more of us that Kathy Hochul should be scared. I'm going to leave it at that and bring out another friend of Marvin, another assembly member from Brooklyn, Miss Joanne Simon. So I'm Assembly Member Joanne Simon, and I fought for and was happy to vote for bail reform That's right. in 2019. Woo! I want to tell you all that this is the same battle that we fought then, and the reality is the people who are saying that it's not working now are operating in the same fact-free zone that they were then. That's right. And they were alleging it wasn't working before it was even in effect. Yeah. Yeah. So all of these arguments are the same arguments we've heard. What we have now, unfortunately, is a terrible misuse of language. We have a acting chief administrative judge of the New York State court system who says bail is not the problem. Who said the judges understand how to interpret the law. The judges do understand what least restrictive means is. It's in fact a constitutional standard that has been in effect in terms of the Supreme Court endorsing it since 1970. Mm -hmm. And New York did, did that in 1973. So the reality is when you have a deprivation of liberty and being incarcerated is an extreme deprivation of liberty, right. you must have be released if there, unless there is any other way to address the issue of ensuring your return to court. So if you're at risk of flight, like the, the guy in the mobster case that the court said made this decision about, he was at risk of flight. He had the money and the ability, he was a mobster, he had the ability to flee, right? Most people do not have that ability. So what we did in bail reform is working. It has reduced crime. Crime did not go up in California and in the middle of this country because of our bail reform laws. Just the other day, California closed at Whole Foods in San Francisco because of repeat offenders stealing food and other products from the Whole Foods. That was not because of our bail laws, right? So let us also have a little lesson. I'm sorry, I, I thank you for your attention. I yeah. law school. And that is the word recidivism is being used by other people, including very senior people in the city. Homelessness. And recidivism does not mean a repeat offender who goes to the Dwayne Reed and takes toothpaste three times a week. That is a repeat offender. And by the way, it was a rollback to bail that addressed that issue. And in fact, if you are a repeat offender, you are there is bail eligibility. Bail is not granted by the legislature, by a court. So the courts are following the, the, the spirit of the law as well. So the reality is recidivist is somebody who's been incarcerated and then is released and then reoffends. So by calling repeat offenders recidivists, we are scaring people and we are talking about a group of people that are not the same as the people. And that is what helped ratchet up this fear and this belief that somehow or other bail reform caused an increase in crime. It did not. It didn't cause it here. It didn't cause it anywhere else. And let me just say one word about mental health, and I know it's not on the show. You know, about 20 years ago, I was told that it was and I looked at about three, three, six worth of photos 
right? Or who might have been the person who was possible. He wasn't there. But it was very clear to me as somebody who had been in disability rights for years, at least a third of those people were obviously people with mental and intellectual disabilities. So we know that the people get picked up, we know that the people can't fight that, we know the people who are impoverished, we know the people who are likely to be um, incarcerated pre-trial are in fact those most vulnerable people in our society. Um, I want to point to everybody, I'm on the street and not jail still, but I want to point you to A1699, which actually would have a great effect, I'll tell you why, and then I'll shut up. And that is, uh, what they do now, every every judge can ask for a psychopath, in order to psych them. So they give the person a voucher and say, here, this is the person with serious mental illness, that we're wondering whether they're competent. You give them a, a uh, voucher and say, here, make an appointment. You do not need to be a mental health expert to realize that person's not going to call that number and make an appointment for three weeks hence for a psychopath. My bill would get the that evaluation right away, and the results of that would be uh, communicated to the court in the setting of conditions of release. So, I want to say that there's many ways to skin this cat to the extent people have concerns. We can do this in a way that is fair and just and actually attends to people's needs. So, thank you very much for listening, and, um, and thank you very much for having us on the hottest day of the year. <laughs> I promise y'all, the you. legislators that support us know what they're talking about. And the legislators that support us care about this issue. But we need more legislators to support us. We need more of them to actually know what they're talking about and not be scared off by fear mongers. I'm an advocate. I work for New York Communities for Change, but I have love for a lot of different advocacy groups, and one of them is Vocal New York. So for everybody make some noise for my friend Dewan Collins from Vocal New York. Since then, I've been able to be reunited with my son, been able to establish housing, been able to establish a foundation and a program to give back to the communities. Because that's what it's about. It's about giving back, right? It's about doing what we love to do for our community. And that's, it's, they say it takes a, a, a village to raise a child. So let the village out, man. <laughs> let the I'm village out. out. Because we are the village. That's right. That's right. We are the village, man. And it is my hope that the people of New York will stand with us in solidarity as we tell Governor Hope no rollbacks. 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 It's hot. I'm not going to say anything else. I'm going to bring up the next speaker. Blazo <laughs> Tando is the next speaker. Yeah. Woo! Woo! Here we go. Oh, it's right there. Let's go. Come on, Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Lysandra. L E Z 
A-N-D-R-E, and my last name is Hodges, K-H-A-D-U. I'm the mother of Stefan Kadu. My son passed away September 22nd, 2021, on the boat. I just, I got a few things. I just, let me look at my phone. This is real life. Um, It's horrific that lawmakers have already set so many, have already sent so many people to the island to die. My son was one of those people that I sent there. My son was one of those people that died. My son died from an inhumane system that's designed to take away black and brown people from their communities and either keep them there forever or they die. My son died from meningitis. My 24-year-old son, who turned 24 September 11th, died 11 days after his birthday. Let's get that out in the open. And like they said, so many more people are being put there and left there to die. Most of them are black and brown people. Most of them are mothers like me. That I pray those 6,000 mothers or wives or whoever, family members, would never have to be where I'm at. I don't want to be here today. I didn't decide to be here today. It got put into my life because the system is designed to destroy a person like me. But like they say, Marvin Mayfield, when I met him here, the first campaign I did, communities not cages, he put the battery in my back. He told me he want me to take my pain and my hurt and put it into a fight and use my words and my pain and continue to speak. And I ain't never stopped speaking. So let's get this out here. I'm never going to stop speaking. And again, I'm not only speaking for Stefan Kadu. I'm speaking for the rest of those families and the rest of those young men that lost their lives because of inhumane system. I'm speaking for the rest of those boys and men that I call my family that's still on that torture island. I'm speaking for them, and I'm going to continue speaking. So like I was saying, huh, it's horrifying that lawmakers have already sent so many people to die at Torture Island, Rockers Island, the boat, and continue sending them there. Ooh. It's unbelievable that the governor, again, it's unbelievable that the governor wants to roll back. It's unbelievable to me as a mother that's grieving still to this day. Don't be mine. Don't mind what y'all see. I put this on because I have to come out here strong. I've just existed every second. And all these amazing people around me, they became my family because the most horrific time in my life, because I got a governor that she's gonna try to make it her business to keep people in a place where people are dying. My son, my son died from meningitis, but this governor keeps sending them there. Oh, oh, I'm so mad, y'all. Excuse me, I'm so mad. They say healthcare is taboo. Governor, again, is helping. Oh, God, I'm sorry, guys. Just take your time. No, I'm good. And like I said, it's unbelievable that the governor is helping the whole state budget. She's holding the whole state budget hostage, I mean. I'm sorry, guys. She's holding this whole state. She's holding it budget. She's holding the budget. She's holding it for hostage. She is basically condemning, condemning more people to these deadly jails. She's trying her best to send all these people back to this jail. It don't make sense to me. And it don't make sense to a lot of people. But people are scared to stand up for what's right. We gonna keep standing up for what's right. Again, oh man, I'm so mad y'all. She's sending them back there to these deadly jails and others across the state. Jails don't make me safe. Jails more, she's trying to jail more people to these places 
and to tell me, let me stop you. She's basically telling me that she wants to send these people back to jail to make me more safe? That's impossible. How you putting my son in jail made me more safe? My son died in jail. What about getting into this community like all these people said? My community, we don't got good housing. We don't got good health. On my way here, I just found out another person died. Another person in my neighborhood died. God only knows what they died for. Maybe they died of lack of health, which we know we don't have in our community. We don't have good education. We don't have good housing. We don't have good jobs. But you got the nerve to tell me to roll this back and send these people to jail is going to be more safer for all of us? Let's get right to the thing. This person does not care about someone that looks like me or him. And they coming into the communities, like she said, designing to take away everyone as a family. They taking away fathers from home. So now these mothers are left to do two-parent jobs. Now these kids are left outside to the streets. We don't have any after-school programs. We don't have any community centers. Let me take my glasses off because I'm mad. We don't have nothing. What my kids grew up in 20, 25 years ago, we don't have no more. What we have is, if someone is going through a mental issue, don't take them to the hospital, send them to jail. That's not what we need. Like Marvin said, communities not cages like they continue to say treatment not, not jail. jail treatment not, not jail. jail how many more people let's speak it how many more people are going to be in my shoes i don't want no one else to suffer what i'm suffering but again as long as we stand out here like we are and continue to fight we will get it done also by the way i'm sorry i am also a member of freedom agenda and we're going to keep advocating and we're going to keep fighting. And as long as I'm breathing, I'm here. Again, I'm the mother of Stefan Kadu. My son died on the boat because of an inhumane system. My son was hospitalized July 6th to July 12th of 2021. Meningitis can be caught. There are two forms. One kills you in 24 hours. They did not care about my son. They did not care about my child because he came from a black and brown community. But as long as I am here, I will be the voice for my angel and for all 36 angels that left this earth for no reason other than an inhumane system. Thank you and have a good day. Nah, keep making noise. Nah, keep making noise. Don't do that. Keep making noise. It's been three years. There is not a statistic, there is not a data set that proves what Kathy Hoku wants. What Kathy Hoku wants is what you all just saw right here standing next to me. She wants pain from communities of people who look like me and look like my sister right here. And that is why we are out here right now. I'm going to bring up our next speaker, Marquise Jenkins from Common Justice. Ain't no power like the power of the people, because the power of the people don't stop. Ain't no power like the power of the people, because the power of the people don't stop. Thank you. My name is Marquise Jenkins. I'm the director of organizing at Common Justice. Common Justice is the first alternative to a the first alternative to incarceration and victim service in the country to address violent felonies in adult court. Right here in Manhattan. Brooklyn and the Bronx. We work with victims of violence and people who have caused harm using a restorative justice model for over 10 years. We at Common Justice believe that strong, safe communities, something that we all know New Yorkers want, can and must be fostered without relying on incarceration. It is because of this belief that we stand proudly with our fellow advocates to call upon our store, state lawmakers to protect current bail. Black and brown New Yorkers are already disproportionately surveilled, policed, arrested, prosecuted, and jailed in our deadly criminal justice system. The rollbacks to bail reform proposed by Governor Hoku were only few. Mass incarceration amplify existing racial 
and economic inequality that threatens community safety. For far too long, we have heard from those in power that the only way to achieve safety following harm is through incarceration. That if we lock people away in prison or jail, we will have stronger communities. That if we use punitive methods, we will meet the needs of survivors. Simply not true. Prison do not make us safe. Let me say that again. Prisons do not make us safe. In fact, bail reform has resulted in lower re-arrest rates and increased court appearance rates. Ironically, though, delays to the passage of the New York State budget caused the governor to push to change existing bail laws are preventing bail that is actually, that, that bills that actually increase safety from becoming law. State lawmakers must ex exclude the government's proposed rollbacks from the budget now so that we can focus on ensuring that communities across New York get access to resources and the support that they need to thrive. Like housing, mental health care, drug treatment, education, violence prevention, and victims' compensation. Survivors themselves know that these supports are what should be what we should be investing in over incarceration. 68% of victims want investment in crime prevention, crisis assistance, and strong communities instead of more arrest, stricter punishment, and incarceration. New York State cannot continue to incarcerate its way to safety. New York State cannot continue to extract money from systematically under-resourced communities while refusing to meet the same community's basic needs. New York State cannot continue to condemn black and brown community members to deadly pretrial conditions in the name of survivors. We must protect fair laws. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Last up. I know it's been hot. Yasmin Farhain from the Immigrant Defense Project. Thank you, Yasmin. It's all good. Yasmin, my name is Yasmin, and I'm here with the Immigrant Defense Project. This is a racial justice issue. It is therefore an immigrant justice issue as well. The Immigrant Defense Project fights back against the criminalization of immigrants caught at the intersection of the criminal and immigration legal system. One year ago, just over one year ago, we joined 30 immigrant justice organizations from across New York State in demanding that the governor and lieutenant governor do not roll back bill reform. We told her at the time that from immigrant communities across the state, we knew clearly that doing so would cause more harm and violence to Black, Latinx, and immigrant communities in this state. What are we still doing here a year later? We know that free trial jailing coerces immigrant New Yorkers into accepting pleas in overcharged cases out of fear of risking detention by ICE and deportation. We know that they have to make impossible choices and that so much of the fight for bail reform and what was won has benefited immigrant New Yorkers who are now able to more often stay with their families, stay in their jobs, stay in their homes because of the victory that so many of the community members and Marvin and organizations that are here today fought for. We cannot go back. We won't go back. Nope. We won't. And we will continue to make clear every step of the way that this is an issue that impacts immigrant New Yorkers because immigrant justice is racial justice. Yep. And we will not be divided. Thank you, guys. Take all of you out here for standing out here with us in solidarity. I want to thank all the advocacy groups. I want to thank every single legislator who came out here. I want to thank every single lawyer who's out here. Shout out to the Bronx defenders because those are my guys. <laughs> This is a long fight. Hope was on the wrong side. We're on the right side. Continue to fight. Keep this energy up. And the last thing I'm going to say is, 
Marvin is with us, everybody. Thank you for coming out. Have a great day. Thank you.